Oh, I thought I'd give you a supplementary uh, video, just kind of going over uh, the videos we're going to watch this week. There's a lot of them. As I told you, we'll be listening to a lot of music and looking at a lot of videos in this class. And now we've got some of the fundamentals out of the way. You're going to see how that happens. First of all, in the classical music uh, week six period, if we scroll down, this is the Dufay, the early, the very first guy on the history of um, European music that we um, pointed out in our first video. And you've already heard that. You can listen to it again. Now here, video number one is the evolution of the piano. Now start um, at the beginning. You can stop around 5 minutes and 27 seconds. It goes more lengthy. Um, this rather nerdy guy who knows a lot about pianos takes you through the whole history of, and he actually has, here's a, the, the very first clavichord. It's a box on top of this big piano here, and he shows you the various stages. There's the first piano, second, third, and finally today's piano. So there was an evolution of that. And um, the big thing to know, the difference between the pianos here uh, was that the hammer hit the piano. Like I showed you in my video, what you're going to see here is that they did not have hammers. They used a different method, and you want to study that. The next video, number two, how, uh, it says violin number one, but anyway, how a violin is made. This is kind of interesting because... Um, it really shows you in depth um, how it's done, and, and, and it's it's quite a craft, actually, and the Italians were really good at it. That's one I'll ask you a few questions about as well. Now, here is Gregorian chant, which is very early um, in the Renaissance period. This is music that was for the church, Amer the, the Catholic church primarily, and it was named after a pope named Pope Gregory. So not only did the church control the music, the Pope could actually dictate how he wanted the music to be done. And this is an example. It is pretty music. Listen to enough of it so you get a sample of what it sounds like. Because in your test, you'll have an uh, audio test again. And I'll play these types of song, mu uh, musical styles of Europe. And, I'll, and you'll have to tell me what style it is. And so kind of listen enough so you can get a good idea what it sounds like. Next is when women enter the church, and all voices are included. Now, remember the four voices of the human voice, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. In the Gregorian chant, it was just men, and basically they were priests and brothers. In this uh, example, a little later on, the church gets more expansive, and you'll listen to this sound of music, which has men and women both. That's your cue when you have the audio test, all right? We're moving through the periods here. Now, I play this because... This is an interesting example of a Mozart piece. He starts to change it. It's, an, it's a piano piece, and these bars represent when sounds are played. Here, if it's green, it's chords, okay? And if it's yellow, it's individual notes. And you're going to hear some emotion come out of this music, uh, maybe not for the first time ever, but certainly you see that although he is writing in a, in a very organized way, like Bach intended or like Bach started, there's an expression of beauty that comes out that be, this really begins with Mozart because there's some Bach stuff that's very beautiful too, but a lot of Bach stuff is just like an exercise. And it doesn't really relate too well. It's more designed to, um, I don't know, it doesn't speak to the human as much. Mozart changes that quite a bit, I think. Don't get me wrong. Bach is like deeply, as deep of a musician and an artist as any of them, and he has some music. Then I go to a movie clip. Now, here I play a short clip of the movie Amadeus. It's online right now. And it shows the environment that Mozart wor worked in. Now, let me explain this scene to you. Uh, Mozart, as I told you, worked for kings. He worked for King Joseph of Australia at the time. Austria, I'm so sorry. Austria, which is next to Germany in Europe, not Australia. That's where the kangaroos are. Austria. And here you see the king... And the, the other musicians that work for him. Now, the king has found out that there is essentially, floating around Europe, a Michael Jackson. I mean, Mozart is, in fact, Michael Jackson of his day. He is playing concerts around Europe at age four. He's playing violin. He's playing uh, uh, the clavichord. He's doing things blindly, upside down. He He's unbelievable. And he composed his first work at age five he composed uh, multiple symphonies and he started he was a prodigy look up the word child prodigy you might know it already if you don't know it there's certain people that are super gifted he's one of them from day one and he dies at age 31 
yet he has dozens and dozens of pieces that he wrote. He was the greatest composer of his time. He lived from he, he, he lived a short period of time. He studied from a composer named Haydn, which was before him, and Haydn was kind of the first one to really establish certain forms of the symphony, early, early symphony. Um, and, you know, Beethoven follows him shortly afterwards and extends it. But in this scene, the head composer for the king, uh, who's got the full-time job there, okay, he writes a little welcome song for Mozart's arrival that's coming as a guest. And the king is a amateur pianist, and he uh, takes lessons from this, his composer. And so he asks the composer, when Mozart walks in, could I play the little song you, of welcome you did for him? And he said, oh, we'd be honored. You know, these guys are falling all over the king, right? Because he's our boss. And um, so the king practices for a short bit and enters Mozart. Now, Mozart, he thinks somebody else is the king. He bounces to the wrong guy, et cetera. And, um, and the king, uh, someone points out and says, hey, it's the king on the piano. He's the one. You know, so then Mozart bows in. And what's funny is the king at the end says, Would you, I'm going to give you this piece of music that Salieri, our composer of, that works for me, wrote for you. And Mozart says, in a, what would be considered a very rude way, that's okay, it's already in my head. And the king makes him sit down and, pr and prove it. And Mozart plays it the first time through, and then he, could, he, <laughs> he starts to fix it, basically, and make it better and embellish it. And um, it's quite a funny scene, but it shows you how structured and really constipated everything was back then. I mean, you had to do it the king's way and all that, and Mozart breaks that mold. I think you'll enjoy that scene. Here we're going to show you what an orchestra looked like in Mozart's day. He developed a lot of music for orchestra, but it was a very small orchestra by comparative standards. And so watch that uh, to get a sense of how small his orchestra was. These are some modern-day musicians who are performing Mozart's Symphony Number no. 31, okay, like the guy was 31, he, he's got more than 31 symphonies. And um, this shows you exactly the instrumentation that was used. The next one I want you to watch is the larger symphony. Where Be this is what Beethoven expands the symphony. This is Beethoven's nice symphony. This is the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. These are all a choir. He brings cho choral and, and orchestra music together, and one, this one is one of his most famous ones. And I think you want to start on this one. Um, well, where I have it set, I guess. I'm sorry to put the marking, but you can go towards the back end and hear the ending somewhere about here. Or you listen to the whole thing. It depends, you know, what your taste is. And a lot of people have trouble listening to a whole city. This is quite interesting. The difference between, once you get is the difference between the size and the scope of a symphony in Beethoven's time versus Mozart's time. And they're not that, that much different. They knew about each other. Then I want you to read a very this little thing here about Beethoven's deafness. Beethoven went deaf over time. He went deaf because he was taking what they thought was a cure for syphilis at the day, which he had. He was kind of a playboy. And um, I think it was mercury. Yeah, they used to give him mercury. And it, it, it wiped him out. I mean, it killed him eventually. But he, the man went deaf. He, he, this symphony you're hearing here in this video, he composed it. And he never heard it. You might say, how does that happen? We talk about it later. He's got it all in his head. As Mozart said in his previous video, in this one, he'll, you'll see here. He tells the king, oh, I got the music in my head already. That's what great people can do. But read this. It'll be part of your exam. Read about Beethoven's deafness. It's very interesting in how he compensated for that. And then what I did next is I show you a film, just a little snippet of a film of Beethoven uh, we don't know for sure he took this approach. I would think he did. This is Beethoven laying his ear on the piano while he's composing Moonlight Sonata in this film, trying to hear the notes. Pretty startling thing. And keep in mind, when you read about his deafness, realize that this piece he never heard. In fact, he conducted it totally deaf. Uh, you'll read about some of that in this exercise here. Next, we have the Romantic period, the the most dramatic romantic period composer ever. Start this at 108 and listen to, to the end. This is Claudio Obato, who is the, he's dead now. He's one of the greatest, this is the most complicated orchestra music this is. 
but it's still melodic and pretty. Mahler is the guy who influenced all future composers of film, TV, commercials, games. He stretched melodies and harmonies to their nth degree and, and before what some people call the weird sounds came in in the 20th century. And he is an Austrian just like Mozart, the Germans and the Austrians, Bach is German, Beethoven is German, Mozart is German-Austrian. They're like, it's like West Virginia, Virginia, that's Austria and then in Germany, they're, they're interchangeable, they both speak German language. Um, and then Mahler, who was Austrian. So there's this connection between Mozart who breaks the mold and stops writing for kings and bishops and Mahler who writes strictly for the world of humans, right? And then at, once World War I starts, once the 20th century starts, once modern things come in, classical music continues in modern sounds, which means more out of tune sounds to your ear. What we called in a previous, in last week, dissonant sounds. It reflects the atmosphere of the post-war years of World War I, the modern industrialization, the moving of men off of the farm and into the cities and women going to work and the destruction of war and poison gas used in war and the atom bomb, and all the negative, non-emotional, non-romantic things in human life today. That's the story of the 20th century. I like this piece because it also includes modern dance or ballet, as we referred to in the first thing. And I think that um, you'll find some, I'd like you to listen to this whole piece. How long is this thing? Let's see. Um, you'll hear a lot of tension in here. I think these are real emotions too. I don't, I, I mean, certainly Mahler in this piece has some very distraught human expressions. But this is different. You know, you can play certain things in strange sounds and a little bit out of tune sounds, I can usually turn out of, out of tune, it's really dissonance, to create tension as Mahler did, for example. But in this piece, not only are they writing about man and his emotions, they're writing about the effects of the modern day on people. You hear the sounds of the modern day in here. And that's a lot of videos for the week. So I hope you enjoy them, listen to them, take the time to listen to them. Uh, keep your mind open. This is great stuff. And the last thing I want to tell you about classical music, make a comparison, analogy for you, is that pop songs are short stories. Um, they can be poems. Um, classical music is novel. It's the great musical novels of that time. And um, when we get to jazz in Africa, we're going to see that's the great human expression of music that no one in the world had ever done until they came to America and blended, all of it blended together. And we have the birth of jazz, which is the foundation of all pop music, as well as what happens in Latin America. But we're getting ahead of ourselves, so watch these videos. I will give you a little study guide on what to study for the quiz, which comes out on Thursday. And I'll be completing all grading so that we're up to date. Between now and probably end of the day Monday, I've, uh, I'm gone on Saturdays uh, judging bands this weekend and last and one more weekend. So we will kind of get more saying. This will all be due. Your this uh, the discussion group will be posted uh, later tonight, and uh, we'll be on Sunday nights. We're putting our deadlines on Sunday now. We're starting to be cut off. All right, and hope you enjoy it.